Good evening, everyone. It's always a pleasure to be here with you guys. Let me get my tools. So today, we're going to be talking about the two certainties in life. Can anybody guess what they are? And we are in April. That's a clue. <laughs> so the two certainties are uh, taxes and death. Most of us cannot avoid taxes. And as we just had April 15 pass, we always know the time is coming, we know the day, even though this year because of the pandemic, it got delayed a little bit. We have a couple more weeks to prepare that, but we know it's gonna come. We know we have to take a little bit of our salaries, our paycheck every time, living there and we get the receipts, we make all the, the deductions, everything that we need, we prepare. And then April 15 comes along, we file our forms, file the taxes, and then we figure it out. Have I put enough in there? Have I contributed enough? If so, great, you may have a little bit in return. If not, then we must go ahead and pay the difference. So for that, we always prepare. We know it's gonna come. There's no way to avoid. We prepare, we deal with. But the other one, the, the death, we know it's gonna come, but we don't always prepare. Most of the times, we just ignore. It's easier to ignore. We pretend that that's not gonna happen. And the main reason we do that is because of fear. Three types of fear mainly. Fear of the unknown. We don't know what's gonna happen afterwards. We don't know where we're going. We don't know how it's gonna be. We don't know, we just don't know. Also, we are afraid of being away from the loved ones. Besides public speaking, the most common fear of any human being is death. And those are the two differences, fear of the unknown or being away from the loved ones. But also there's attachments. Some people don't wanna lose all their life's work. They don't wanna lose their houses, their cars and boats and anything they acquire. Now, the famous Brazilian medium, Chico Xavier, he went a little bit further and he explored the topic saying that could be that the fear that we have of death, it's because we bring with us some memory, unconscious, but it's our memory of the time we spend in the umbrella. Now, if you ever read any book that talks about the umbrella, the places that we go if we're not having our energies balanced, if we're having too much attachments to the life, the life things that we, we occur here, we may go to this place called Ombra. There, there's a lot of torments in there. So he, he wonder if the fear it's because of this memory of times that we've been there before through our many disincarnations and reincarnations all the times in between it, it may have happened to us so that's one of the the reasons that he came that could, could be but for those other three reasons can we do anything for that can we prepare in any way to take away all the fear and yes, the answer is yes. And the way we can do that is to understand the process. 
just as if we are going on a trip, what we do first before we go, especially if it's a place that we don't have many accounts, we don't know much about it. So we're going to be gathering the maps, we do the research, we make an itinerary, we look what are the local customs, what are the currencies, what language do they speak, are there places that I should be avoiding. So we put all this research so when we actually go on the trip, everything will be more enjoyable, we will be much more comfortable. So we should prepare the same way as, we, as if we're going on a trip. And life is a journey, so it is another trip that we're going through. So for today, I grabbed this book called Who's Afraid of Death by Richard Simonetti. In this book, he's so amazing. The way he, he talks like if he's just talking to us. He's not trying to make a book full of beautiful words and complex theories. He's just talking like, well, let's be real here. Let's, let's answer your questions. So we're going to be using some of those questions, the, the most frequent questions about that, and we're going to explore a little bit. Of course, as you can imagine, each topic that we're going to talk about today will be a lecture in itself. So we're just going to brush it up a little bit, just to put a little seed in your mind that you go home and say, okay, I want to know a little more about that, and then we can explore in the future. So... This book will be tips, analysis, how to behave, how to react. So when we're facing with the death, which is certainty, it's going to be a little less scary and less, less painful. So for that, first, let's understand what we mean when we say disincarnation. Most people outside will talk about death. And why do we say disincarnation? We don't talk much about death per se. So if you guys go back to the Spirit's book, the question 135, Kardec is asking the enlightened spirits, what is there be besides the body and the soul? Is there anything more? And the spirits will say, yes, there's another component there. It's a semi-material type of body that connects the spirit to the physical body. So that semi-material will give the ability for the spirit to act into the body. Otherwise, the body will be just limping and the spirit will be poking and say, okay, move, and nothing will happen. So when we're talking about disincarnation, it has to do with this semi-material body between the spirit and the physical body. So the physical death, we're talking about the body itself. That's when the heart stops beating, the brain sees all activities, the body itself, the matter, it's dead. There's no vitality going through. Now when we're talking about disincarnation, that's when we're talking about the semi-material body that we call the pure spirit and the spirit are actually detaching, disentangling from the physical body. So that's a process. So do you guys think that both happen at the same time? I got one no, two no's. Okay, we're in the right direction. So once the physical death happens, once the heart stops, brain sees activity, that's body death. Now for the other part, for the spirit to actually leave, it may take a few hours, it may even take days. And the difference here will be depending on the impressions of the physical existence. What does Simonetti mean by that? He says that the addictions, the passions, the materialism, and the denial of higher goals leave a fluid impregnation on the individual, on the body and the spirit. So 
for that disengagement, for that disconnection to happen, it will be a slow process. It will be slower as more attachments that person has. Now, he reminds us that if needed, it can be done at once by spirits that are trained for that process. They are spirits that their sole job will be to help this transition period for us, for the incarnated ones. But they try not to do that. They, they try to avoid to the sudden disconnection because it will be much more difficult for the spirit to then adapt to the spiritual life. And as he's explaining, it reminds me of those afternoon naps that you go so deep that you wake up, you forget your name, you forget it is Monday or Friday, is it afternoon, how many hours have I been sleeping? We feel disoriented, we feel sometimes even the shaking that we are feeling through our bodies, and we just took a nap. Now imagine if we had gone through a whole existence and suddenly now you're disconnecting for real from your body. So that can be quite traumatic if it has, done, if it has to be done suddenly. Now he talks also about different types of death. And now we're talking about the physical part of the death. It could be sudden. The person holds great impressions and interests on the physical life. Difficult detachment if not familiar with spiritual values. So the more attached to earthly things we are, more difficult will be this disconnection if the body have a sudden death because the spirit's still connected in there. Now, another process, there is more like a lengthy death, a length pass away. Mostly those are cases of chronic diseases. So the process helps the person to slowly detach from the impressions and the needs of physical life. Most people that have chronic diseases or those diseases that they know there's no, no cure, they will be already thinking about, okay, what's coming after? So they have time to ponder about all those things that we're going to be thinking about today and they have a little bit easy going on the process because they are already kind of preparing themselves. One thing that I thought was very beautiful the way Simonetti put in here, he says that prolonged disease, disease is a beauty treatment for the spirit. The physical pain acts as an invaluable therapeutic resource helping you to overcome illusions in the world, in addition to purging the moral impurities. So we can see how we may think a long, painful, chronic case, a disease, sometimes we think that's such a sad way of going. But for the spirit, sometimes that is the best case scenario. Somebody that will be going through a sudden death sometimes don't have the time to think about what's happening and suddenly have to deal with the situation as it already happened. Other type of death that he talks here, it's the old age. So physical life extinguishes slowly. Mainly he's talking about when the people have a discipline, a virtuous life, have some knowledge of spiritual values. So their life slowly, like a candle fading away, it just pass on. You may be a hundred years old and still very much attached to everything in earth, so the process is not gonna be as, as slow and peaceful and gentle as the individuals who have a more spiritual knowledge of life. All right, so let's talk about one of the hard topics here. Some of the difficulties on the way back, on the returning. 
first of them is unexpected recovery. Have you guys ever heard of those situations where somebody's very sick, is at the hospital, and suddenly, one usually at night time, the person got better, and everybody thought, oh wow, maybe maybe it's a turning point, maybe we'll have a chance here, and right after the person passed away. So why 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 does that happen? Two reasons. When loved ones are not accepting the separation. So we, the ones watching somebody we love going through that process, we may be in a position that we are not accepting. Even if it's even if we're not voicing that out. But we are praying and praying, and our prayers are the kind of prayers that are saying, please, God, let the person stay here with me. I cannot face going through this right now. And with that, we create what he calls in the book a, a kind of retention web. So with that, we are promoting artificial support of the physical life. That doesn't mean we are helping that person at all. We are only prolonging the process. And with that, we are just causing a little more harm. So what the spirits that are helping that disconnection, disconnection helping the process, they will infuse energy. They will help that person have a little bit of recovery so everybody else will, okay, grandma is doing a little better. I can go home, I can take a shower, we can do our things, and we'll come back later. And when everybody calm down and stop that, that hold, that web that they are putting around the person, then the spirits have an opportunity to go on and finish the process. That would be much I hate to say painful. There will be much more in, not enjoyable either. There will be better for the person. There will be a easy of process instead of having to fight all the energy that we are putting in there. So the technicians of spirituality promote an artificial recovery of the patient to have a truth in the vigil and to be able to start the disconnecting process. That's how Simonetti places in the book. So that's one of the, the difficulties of the returning. Now, in very rare occasions, the well-balanced individuals can have enough presence of mind, can have enough knowledge of the spiritual life that they can be aware of their own process. But that's very rare. Those are for the spirits that have been studying, have been working on their moral values for a while, and they have the capability not to not to put any harm to themselves, not be so lost and so anguished that they would make it harder. Now for us, common individuals, here learning, trying to figure it out what's happening, we fall into unconsciousness, and then we awake in a state of dizziness and agitation. Like we talk about when we take the nap, imagine that, that big of wake up that, that we have will be dizziness, ag agitation, but we'll be having help during the process. One of the things that can help the process, prayers from loved ones in the care of spiritual benefactors that will accelerate the understanding, our understanding, but essentially this will depend on the level of attachment to the human fantasies and the capacity to stimulate new realities. If you're a stubborn person right now, you're probably gonna wake up being stubborn, dizzy, and agitated. So it will depend, it doesn't matter how much help you get, it will depend on you to have the clarity, to have 
capacity to assimilate what's happening now. Infallible resource, either if we're watching somebody going through that or if it's our own case, will be prayer. Not the kind of prayer that we talked on the beginning that's holding somebody that we loved here, but the kind of prayer that we'll be releasing, we'll be accepting. Just like we have on our Father, thy will be done. That means we are accepting what's going through. Give us strength. We're not going to be asking, keep Grandma here because I cannot see her. She's only 94. Let her live a little, few more years. No, that'll be the prayer of, Thank you, God, for allowing me to have such an amazing person in my life. Help her on this process, have clarity, be an easy transition. So the way we pray, it can be an infallible resource or it can be a web of entanglement. Difficult, right? All right, another thing that has a little to do with the message from the beginning that Marcia read to us. Is it time? There's no way to avoid, but is it our time? Most, in, in reality, very few of us use all the time we have allowed it. We compromise our physical stability, we compromise our mental stability, we compromise our spirit by the actions that we take here in life. So we may destroy our body from the outside in. And how we do that? Addictions, intemperance, indiscipline, alcohol, smoking, toxic substances, food excesses, chocolate, unfortunately, as well, lack of exercise, hygiene, not wearing masks right now. All those things, we can undermine organic resistance over the years and we can shorten our physical life. So there's a, I don't know if, if it, that'll be translatable to English, but there's a weird saying in Brazil that we say the only person that dies the day before is the turkey. Because we're talking about the eve of Thanksgiving or so it's the turkey always gonna buy die on the day before Thanksgiving or the day before Christmas and when I would say you have your day you're gonna you have a certain amount of time allotted to you and there's no way out of that but in truth we can shorten our life by our actions now when we're talking about the physical that's it but we can also destroy our body from the inside out. So there'll be cultivation of negative thoughts, unhappy ideas, we don't do that, right? Unbalanced, unbalanced feelings, jealousy, envy, pessimism, hatred, resentment, revolt, and the list goes on and on and on. There are individuals so used to reacting from irritation and aggression that one day they just have a heart attack. They just implode their hearts. Others drown the immune system in a flood of hurt, resentment, depression, and anguish, favoring the development of cancerous tumors. Now, a little disclaimer here. When you go to work tomorrow and your friend comes and say, my mom just found out she has cancer. If you turn to her and say, Adriana told me that your mom is having depression and anguish, that's why she's having cancer, I'm not going to be happy. <laughs> that's not what I'm saying. Not all cases are that. A lot of diseases and processes and circumstances that we have in life, it's part of our incarnation plan. So there are cancers that we choose to have, and there are cancers that we're causing either by our emotions or how we treat our body. So those are things that could happen. I'm not saying that every time it just happened, that's, those are the reasons, okay? All right, so what can we do? 
Just like if we're renting a car for a long trip, we're renting a body for a long trip. We're gonna take care of the body, we're gonna take care of our minds, we're gonna do some little maintenance. So by the time we are returning that to the rental agency, they're not gonna say, yeah, you, you really mess up this body. Next time you're gonna get a lemon car. Or you're gonna get a, a very old model broken down. Now, as long as we take care, we take responsibility for what we are giving, we are for sure going to have much better next time. All right, now things start to get tougher. Let's talk about tragedies. We all lose the ground beneath our feet when we are faced with a tragic death involving our loved ones. It's impossible not to. Doesn't matter if you, you're a spiritist and you, you've studied a, a lot about death and disincarnation and reincarnation and the whole process. It doesn't matter. You're going to feel the physical distance from the person you love and that's going to hurt. Most of the time, those tragic passings will leave anybody in the family in a state of despair, of crisis. And if we are connected to the person, our feelings and our thoughts are also connected to the person. So we have to be very careful how we propagate all these emotions because they may be very vulnerable at this time and we're imprinting all the emotions on them. Although supported by spiritual benefactors, they face predictable difficulties in adapting, feeling the emotions of their relatives echoing in them. So if they're already going through this agitation period, just not knowing exactly what's happening and feeling a little lost, imagine having the constant calling from their families and the constant feeling of everybody's crying, everybody's having a hard time. It, it is like echoing on their, on their ears all the time. Our emotions and our reminiscences of the circumstances of their passing inevitably lead them to relieve it with disturbing ins insistence. Um, there is one book from the, the No Solar series from Andrea Luis. The book is Life in the Hereafter. And Chico Xavier, that I mentioned earlier, he receives a message from a, I think a teenager, a young man that was in a school field trip and the bus had an accident and they fell into a river. And look the message that this little guy sent to his mom. I'm just going to read a little part because it's quite a tough message. But he's saying to his mother, I am here asking you to help me with your patience. I have suffered more with your tears than with the liberation of my body. The mama because your pain ties me to remembering everything that happened. And when you start asking how the disaster would have been in the silence of your despair, I feel asphyxiated again. So the constant thought of his mom wondering how was the accident, how did he feel, could be prevented. She's keeping that on her mental stage and she's impregnating and passing to the sun to the point that he's saying, listening, feeling that was much worse than the passing itself. So we have a responsibility on that way. I'm not saying that we're not going to feel, but how we feel, how we respond to the emotions we are putting out can make a huge difference for them. A common request in the communications with these spirits is for the family member to return to normality and resume their activities, developing new interests, particularly practicing charity and goodwill, which is the divine balm for the pains of separation. 
regardless of how broad our understanding is, we suffer. And perhaps that's going to be the worst pain we're going to go through in our lifetime, losing somebody. However, it is imperative that we maintain serenity, cultivating trust in God, not only for us, but above all, for the benefit of the one who left. So on those first days after a passing that we, seems like we cannot do anything else but to think about the circumstance of the person. The one thing that we must try to do, and it may be the only thing that we can do for a while. Every time those thoughts come to your mind, replace with the same person, but with a good memory. Instead of, imagine for the mother, instead of imagining how did my son fell when he was drowning, the thought should be replaced with something like, I remember how happy he was on his fifth birthday when he got the bike he wanted, and how was his laughter, and how was, how enjoying the moment he was. So those are very tough things to do, but it will help us to change our, our mental state, our train of thought, and it also will help them to feel, because if they're feeling the negative emotions, they're also going to be feeling the good emotions. So instead of receiving from the mother the anguish, he's going to be receiving all the love, all the good times he had in life. So that's one thing we can try to do. Everybody there with me? Everybody's just a tough, tough topic to talk, right? So let's make a little bit tougher. Disincarnation of children. Usually with adults, we try to make up our minds saying, well, had a good life, had just done that. But with children, it's always tough. We always go to, but it was so young, it had a whole life ahead, which we don't know if that statement is true or not. Maybe the plan was to have a very short life. But out of all the tragedies, the disincarnation of children seems to be the most difficult to understand and to overcome. One thing that I like to remind everybody, maybe we talk about the own brow, if we're having that lower vibrations, lower emotions, we may spend time there. Children do not go there. Children are already, they have a much smoother transition because they're just starting. They are not like us with all the addictions and passions. So they are oblivious to all that. So they, they do not have the compromise on their physical existence yet. They didn't have a chance to be so attached to material things. So they have a smooth transition. They do not spend any time on Umbro. If you're interested on this particular topic, there are many books that talk about children in the spiritual world, talk about the schools and the, the nurseries and all the support that they receive. The biggest problem, it's like we talk about the web of retention of the energy, because in a case of a child, sometimes it's not just from the parents and from the family, but the whole com community. Who will not feel on their own heart, especially if you have your own children, when you hear about a mother, a father losing their baby? We all feel and we start to imagine how the person is going to be dealing with that, how, the, how can you live without a baby? So we imprint, along with the family, along with the parents, this whole retention web. And it's so intense, cause it even by us. And why we do that? Symbol of purity and innocence, the little beings sum up the hopes of adults. They refuse to face the prospect of separation. So for the family, it's hard, the separation. For us watching them, we just bleed on our own hearts.
I, another book. <laughs> you guys realize now that I like books, right? I'm not going to read the whole thing. It, on this book, Between Heaven and Earth, there's a father losing his one-year-old son. And he goes through understanding what's happening, having to accept there's nothing else the doctors can do. And he's on the final hours of his son, and he realizes what's happening. And the prayer that he that he says that night, it's, it's amazing. I, I don't know how somebody will have that much presence of mind to accept this way. But I'm just going to tell you a little bit the end of his prayer. If it is your intention for our little boy to live, Lord, receive him in your arms of love and light. Grant us, however, the necessary courage to endure our cross of longing and pain. Giving, uh, give us resignation, faith, and hope. Help us understand your purpose so that your will will be fulfilled today and always. Imagine how hard it would be for a father to say those words. So, for all of us here that are mothers and fathers, we want to do the best, everything that we can for our children, right? If we're ever faced with this situation, the best we can do for our children at the moment it's the same thing I said before, replace the memories, not think about the tragedy, the loss, the pain. Whenever that comes and that will come, we replace to the good memories, to the, to the love, to the acceptance, to flooding that spirit that's parting with everything, all the best that we have in ourselves. All right, I wish I could say let's light, lighten up a little bit, but now we're going to talk about euthanasia now. The term itself means good death. So when they came with the term, Francis Bacon was saying that the doctor have a responsibility, not only to relieve the pain, to, to cure the, the diseases and the illness, but they also have the responsibility of providing the patient with a calm and easy death, if the problem is irreversible. Now, most, real, most religions in general do not accept euthanasia. And the two fundamental principles are, first of all, it is up to God to, to promote our return. It's not up to us. There'll be suicide. It's not up to somebody else. It's up to God. Second of all, of all, no one can say with certainty that there's nothing else that can be done. We have cases after cases after cases in medical literature saying that this person is, there's no, no hope at all, and the person ended up being cured or being able to live for a long time with the, with the disease, with the illness. So for us here in Spiritism, we have a few more reasons why we do not condone euthanasia. So we take a little bit further. We, we demonstrate that euthanasia, euthanasia not only interrupts the purification process that the spirit is experiencing, through the illness, but imposes serious difficulties on the returning to the spiritual plane. Remember when we talk about we talk about cancer and heart attacks and those things that sometimes we choose, it's part of our reincarnation plan. What if a cancer was part of our program? We choose to have certain cancer that will be a long disease, and during that disease you have the chance to expiate past discretions. And now at the first sign of the disease, you finish your life. 
So it could be that you completely throw away your big ticket of recovery, of a spiritual recovery, by, by ending the suffering right there. When he talks about serious difficulties, the body will have, the physical body will be taken by whatever drug is used for the process. But the period spirit will have all the impressions left from the body. And the spirit, which is using the period spirit as a mean to connect with the body, will also, of course, feel all that. I have another book, I'm not going to bring it up, but Workers of Eternal Life, if you're curious, there is a very interesting case there where somebody is sick, it's... He's not even asking for the euthanasia. The doctor decided that it's time. I don't want to see this patient of my suffering anymore. And he goes ahead and, and performs the euthanasia. And it talks through the whole process how difficult it was to the point that that disconnection that we talked about before, that disincarnation process, it took over, t over 20 hours because the pure spirit was feeling like it was still glued to the body. So I encourage you to look that up if you have interest on that topic. Now, organ donor. Just for curiosity, is anybody here an organ donor? Do you guys have that on your ID? Imprinted on the driver's license? Perfect. Most questions that we receive about organ donation is, will they feel it? Well, depends. If the, the process is already happening, if the disincarnation process is already on the way, it may not feel, but there will always be the benefactor spirits helping that process. So the same way that they have the capability of giving passes to us, they help us while we are here incarnated, alleviate our bodies and our chakra, they have the capability of doing that to the person that's passing away in a way that they won't be feeling any effects of whatever organ is being transplanted. Would they have a repercussion on their, their pure spirit? If they donated their eyes, are they going to get to the spirit, spirit world and are they going to be blind? Those are a lot of questions that we get. So, Richard Simonetti tells us in the book that organ donation is a blessed act of charity. Imagine the joy of a spirit in knowing that he has given the other the other person a gift of seeing or breathing or to continue in the carnal sphere completing his incarnation plan. Most of the time when the spirit is recovering in the afterlife the prayers that they receive from the family and the person who received their organs it's a source of light, of love. It helps them tremendously through the process. They receive ample care from the spiritual benefactors, preventing their generosity from implying any constraint in the withdrawal of any body parts. Their will, or anybody's will in that matter, must be respected. Doesn't matter how much you are pro organ donor, if your spouse, your children, anybody that you may be responsible to make those decisions are not, it must be respected. If somebody that's really not for organ donor that feels so attached to their body parts that they may have a hard time afterwards accepting that the process happened. Now, today I also have good news. We do not need to wait until we pass away to help somebody, either their lives or to live a better life. We can donate blood in the meantime. 
we can be part of if you are less than 44 years old i believe you can be part of the bone marrow campaign their database that means you give a little sample of your dna with a cheek swab it stays on the bank they try to match with mostly children having issues needing blood um, bone marrow transplants and to find a match it's like one in 500,000 or something really hard to find so if you are willing please do we have a, a friend here of our center uh, Roosevelt he is amazing with this with this program so if you want more information come and look for me afterwards but the integrity of the spirit is intimately related to the type of life they lead and not to the type of death or the aftercare of their physical bodies. So depending on the life we are living, it, afterwards it will not matter how they're going to dispose of our bodies, if they're going to give the organs to other person, if we're going to be cremated, it doesn't matter because we understand that physical life is only one part. We still have our real main spiritual life there. That we go through the that's the real deal. Now let's talk about something more practical. How to behave at funerals. I'm gonna try to speed through. We're running out of time. First of all, physical presence. Be there for the family. Show solidarity. But how are you going to behave when you're there? That's not going to be a place that we're going to catch up with old friends. We're going to talk about politics and sports. We're going to have a spiritual composure. We're going to be respecting the environment. We're going to be committed to help the departed one. We understand, now we understand how the process is like, we understand how our thoughts affect them, so we're going to act accordingly and help in the process instead of being there causing more disturbance. So the ideal funeral, how would it be? Flowers, soft music, med meditation, serenity on the condolence, nobody will be freaking out and screaming, reading edifying, clarifying text about death, spiritual life show acceptance to god will in prayers when you become a spiritist where when you have knowledge of all this we have also responsibility to act according to it in the book he says if someone is very dear to your heart consider that he needs your courage and your trust in god and if you do not accept the separation, questioning the divine designs, your despair hits them incessantly like a devastating storm of anguish. So this is how important it is for us to know how to behave in a funeral. Now, after the funeral, after care of, of the physical body. In the past, a lot of people had fear, fear of being buried alive. We had enough cases related to us when medicine was not advanced enough. They didn't have a way to really confirm that. So a lot of people got buried alive. And have one little story. Uh, I don't have time. But Charleston, I visited Old Cemetery. Tour guide point to us little bells on every tomb, and they have like those above, above ground tombs because of the the sea level. Pointed to us, they had little bells during pandemics when a lot of people die at the same time, and they didn't had enough time to check that everybody was really dead. Bury them, put a little string on their finger, so if they're alive and they come back, they're moving the bell will sing it will ring and then they come and get them out they just didn't count with the the process of the composition when 
temperature outside goes down, the body gases start to be released, the movement of hands could happen, and a lot of people now are opening all those caskets and finding that no, they are really gone, and it was super traumatic. But that's where the, the phrase saved by the bell came from, because some of them were ended up being saved by the little bell. But today, we do not have this issue anymore. Uh, we have medical profession have to do an examination. They have to sign a death certificate. So one thing we don't have to worry about. Now, burial, cremation, advisable to wait 72 hours, especially when choosing cremation. Um, Information that came from Chico Xavier, psychographing from his mentor Emmanuel, saying that for most cases, most people, the, the transition period that this disentanglement from the physical body to the spirit and the pair spirit will happen in at least 72 hours. Here in the US, most funerals are longer than that, so we don't have to make any special adjustments, any special preparations, or worry about that. It is important to recognize, however, that much more important than such care will be to cultivate a balanced existence marked by an effort of self-renewal and practice of goodness, so that in any circumstance of our death, we may be freed promptly without trauma, without concern, for the faith of our body. So if we're taking care of our spirit, it doesn't really matter what's gonna happen to our physical body afterwards, right? Now finishing, curious obsessions. It is possible that the discarnated person, unprepared, not knowing what's happening, they come back in they come back to their house, to what they know that's familiar. So if they do not realize that the discarnation happened, that the death happened, they may be looking for what is familiar, and most of the times that's their home. In family members that have some kind of medium ability, mediumistic ability, they may start to feel the presence of the person. They may start to feel the same symptoms that they had if there was a passing through an illness. So what do we recommend for those people to do? Come to the, to, to the center, have magnetic passes, have the magnetic water, have the treatment, learn about spiritual life, learn about how to act so we can help not only us, ourselves, but our loved ones. Most likely, they will come along. So for them to be here with the perception that they'll be able to see the spirits, to have a understanding of they are different than, than the incarnated ones, will be a opportunity for them to realize what's happening, to receive some assistance, to, to understand what's going on with them. And now, it is not uncommon, if we're talking about obsessions, it is not uncommon for the disincarnated to be obsessed more than the obsessor. There'll be when we're calling our father, our mother, whoever passed away, if we're constantly calling them and calling them, we are being the trouble. We are causing them trouble. Um, Simonetti is saying here on the book, without defense and without preparation for a spiritual life, the disincarnating person is attracted by family member when they refuse to overcome the anguish of separation, entering a process of mental fixation that confuses and retains him, even when he is ready to go on his way. Therefore, as important as elucidate spirits that disturb the family, it is to teach the family so it does not disturb the spirits. 
and I'm gonna have to cut the final message but if anybody's interested this is the book who is afraid of death I encourage you to take a look to I think we have a copy here that can be borrowed in English we have some two or three there in Portuguese I encourage you to take a look on that and thank you so much